Okay, so we will start the final lecture. So, um, yeah, thank you for being uh, brave enough after the first two to come back for the third. Um, it, it will get better. Okay. <laughs> Um, so last lecture, I talked about hypothesis testing for MMD, which is like telling whether the difference between two samples is large enough uh, that it's unlikely to be due to chance. I'm going to start this lecture with a, a brief and rather simple uh, overview of what it might look like to test for independence using HSIC, which is the MMD between the joint distribution and the product of the marginals. So this one... Uh, looks a little bit different to MMD, and the reason is because MMD was the difference between distributions where you have independent samples from each distribution. But for independence testing, like, you don't have a sample of the independent variables. So you have to sort of invent it by using the samples that you've seen. And so, you know, the statistic looks a little different, and the uh, analysis is, is consequently a little more uh, messy. But the ideas are the same, and so like, you'll sort of see the shape of the way that I do the proof um, in, in the same way. Okay, so here is our statistic. I've written it slightly differently to the uh, notation that I used earlier, but this is not important. The upshot is that modulo some centering operation, which is this H uh, matrix here, it's the dot product between the kernel matrix between all of the similarities in one view and the kernel matrix of all of these similarities in the other views. So if you remember the earlier example, uh, if I have images you know, and associated captions, this is the kernel between all image pairs, and this is the kernel between all caption pairs. And I, I just take the dot product between those two kernels, and if this dot product is large, then I conclude that the images and the captions are dependent. So this is my idea that I, I illustrated with these dogs and cats and their associated descriptions, okay? So now, this is my statistic, and I'm trying to say, like, what is the probability of this statistic, uh, you know, exceeding some thresholds in the case that there is dependence, okay? So I want that under independence, I have a very low probability of exceeding that threshold, and then if I exceed it, then I reject the hypothesis of independence, I conclude that my variables are likely to be dependent. All right. So if you remember, this, this slide is, is deliberately very uh, aggressive looking. <laughs> so um, for MMD, you remember that under the assumption that P and Q were the same, the distribution was its infinite weighted sum of chi-squareds. So this is also true for HSIC, but you know, this is another infinite weighted sum of chi-squareds, but the eigenvalue problem that you have to solve is even nastier, and it's nastier because you've uh, constructed one of your distributions effectively by scrambling up the x's and y's from your dependent variables. So I sort of take each of my observed x's from my dependent x-y pairs, and then I associate it with all possible y's that are not the uh, original y. So basically, like, I've got, you know, my, my picture of my dog, and then I associate it with every other caption except for the caption that's uh, connected to it. And that's my way of sort of creating the independent pairs. Um, so this is the eigenvalue equation, and you're integrating over like four, uh, actually up to th you know three different image caption pairs here, and then it's horrible, and you shouldn't try and do it. Okay. One thing that you might notice, though, is even though this distribution has such a terrible form, it turns out I can compute uh, its variance and its mean because this is a biased statistic in closed form. Okay. So this is, this is a little bit interesting. So um, you know, these terms here are terms that I'm, I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail later in the course. Um, but these are basically traces and uh, sums of singular values of covariances of features. So this detail I'll go into a little bit more later. But the upshot is you can compute these in closed form, even though I can't write down this distribution here. OK, so this is what I know. So how do I simulate now, or how do I find some way of finding a threshold uh, for this null distribution? OK, so here is approach number one, uh, which I can illustrate with some chalk. Right, let's say that I have these pairs. I have x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on and so on, right? And so these are my, the variables that I get, but I want to use these samples to simulate from the distribution that would occur 
if these were completely independent. Okay? Now, what's interesting about this versus this is that these two things are IID. So even though x and y might depend on each other, x1, y1 does not depend on x2, y2. All right? So a way of taking this sample and simulating from the independent version of that sample would be to do this. Right, so what is this pi? This pi is a permutation over the indices 1 through n. So now I've just basically associated with my x1 a randomly chosen y. Okay? So I do that, and then I compute my h sig, my, my dependence quantity for this. And as you might guess, this gives you an, an instance of this dependence in the event that x and y have no relation. Okay? So I can compute my h sick on the basis of that quantity, then I scramble it again and I compute it again, and then basically I get a histogram which looks a bit like the one we saw yesterday, where here is the h sick. This is the probability of observing that h sick under the assumption that x and y are independent. And then I'll get a histogram that will look you know, like this, and it will have like, a slightly heavy tail in this direction. Um, it won't have a zero mean, because I've used a bias statistic here, so just a small detail. And then you know, I use this histogram. I take the threshold at some high quantile, and then I say, OK, that's my test threshold. If my h sick that I've computed on my data exceeds that threshold, then I'll reject the null hypothesis. I'll conclude that it's unlikely that x and y are independent. So is that procedure clear? So similar idea to what I did with MMD yesterday. In MMD, I just threw my samples into a bag and then randomly assigned half to P and half to Q. In this case, I randomly assign Ys to Xs and then use that as my way of simulating from the null. Okay, and that works. Um, so this is, this is one way to do it. The other way uh, is that I'm impatient and I cheat. So basically, I compute the mean and variance, and then I throw it into a gamma distribution, and then I pretend that a gamma distribution is the same as an infinite weighted sum of chi-squares. And that works more often than you might think. So um, on the software that I have on my page, I've got both of these implemented. And like, this is just a quick way of maybe like prototyping, like finding which variables you might think are dependent, but then you should test it rigorously by using this permutation test. Um, of course, this is very fast, because I don't have to repeatedly compute my statistic over lots and lots of permutations. So these are, these are my two approaches. This one has guarantees. This one is a hack which works. So, and it's, it's quite hard to break, unfortunately. Yeah. OK. So remember in the very first lecture, I gave a problem which seemed very difficult, which is, I've got fragments of text in English and fragments in f of text in French, and I want to decide whether there is dependence between these fragments of text. And I want to make this decision like even if I don't speak English or French. So now that I've uh, described a dependent statistic, let's see how it does, OK? So remember that my statistic is this dot product between centered K and L matrices, where the K matrix is the matrix of similarities between all pairs of English text, and the L matrix is the matrix of similarities between all pairs of French text, OK? So each of the little squares in this matrix is the kernel between one fragment of English and another fragment of English. And then the corresponding square in this matrix is the kernel between the matching two French fragments, OK? So you know this is just one fragment. So each of these little squares corresponds to the dot product between one of these little chunks of text and another chunk of text. OK? So what kernel do I use? I use something called a spectrum kernel, which counts the number of substrings that match in these fragments of text. And it allows for things like wildcards, and like you can choose the length of the uh, substrings. So I used uh, substrings of lengths up to 10. And there's software that does a very clever dynamical programming uh, trick to compute these things efficiently. OK, so that's the kernel that I'm using. And if you squint at these two matrices, you can see that they look pretty similar in this case. Because indeed, the text that I used for this example was an instance where the French was translations of the English. 
okay? And, you know, similar fragments of English text correspond to similar fragments of French text, very uh, unlike fragments of English text correspond to very unlike pairs of fragments of French text. So I take this matrix.product and then, you know, uh, it works. So basically, like, I can detect reliably when the English and French translations, uh, when the French is a translation of the English. So the number of times that I miss this dependence is zero using this kernel. But it does matter which kernel you use. So I could also use a bag of words kernel where I just like do a histogram of the words for these extracts and then I compute the dot product of those histograms. And that's valid. There's nothing wrong with that, except that with this less effective kernel, I start missing instances where the English and French text are translations one of the other. So, you know, using a powerful kernel makes sense in this setting. But, you know, the point is that a, uh, like a string kernel, a spectrum kernel, is something that doesn't care terribly much about, you know, the language. It just cares about it as a sort of set of strings. And so I could use this on other pairs of language and I should be able to detect that they're dependent. So are there questions about this example? Okay. So now uh, I kept promising that I would say how to choose the kernel. So this next part is a combination of how to choose the kernel and testing on big data. Um, and the reason that I'm combining these two is that it's rather mathematically convenient, as we'll see, to explain how to choose the kernel when you have a lot of data. This isn't clear yet, but it will be. Okay. So here is my maximum mean discrepancy. It's the average similarity between samples from P plus those from Q minus the average similarity between samples from P and Q. Okay, this is my statistic. And I told you earlier how to compute this statistic, right? So basically, like, if I was computing this expectation up here, the expectation of kxx prime, remember x prime is distributed according to p, but has to be independent of x. All right, so how do I implement this? If I've got n samples from p, I can find an unbiased estimate of this expectation by taking this sum here where I've been careful never to allow j and i to be the same, because I need that xi and xj are like, independent but identically distributed. Yep. So this is unbiased. Like, if I take the expectation of this sum, well, it's the average of the expectations of each of these terms. Each of these terms has this expectation, so I get exactly this quantity. There's no bias. All right? So this is one way to compute this expectation. Here's another. So I've got x1, x2, x3, x4, up to xn. I just take the first two, then the next two, then the next two. So there's m on two pairs. And I take the average of those. And that also works, right? So if I take the expectation of this, it's an average of m on two of these terms, and it has the right expectation. OK? So these are both two answers. This one has you know, almost m squared. This has of order m terms in it. Okay, so since we're going to be talking about choosing the kernel, I'm going to give some more concise notation. Uh, so it's always annoying to get hit with notation in a talk, but I'll have to do this uh, for the rest of it to make sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the MMD as an average over four variables, two x's and two y's, of this h. Okay, where h is the, you know, the within x similarity within y similarity minus the xy similarities, okay? And I need, you know, two x's and two y's so that I can compute this and it makes sense because I need, you know, two independent x's and two independent y's. And the, I guess, so v is my collection of x's and y's that I need for this statistic and h is this kxx plus kyy, etc. And I put this subscript k so that I can keep track of which kernel I use because I'm going to teach you like how to choose a kernel, so now it becomes important in my notation to always know which kernel it is that I'm talking about. So I'm going to always have these subscripts k in my h's to, to keep track of that. Okay? So to tell you, to like, you know, show you what this means in terms of the previous slide, I would write my maximum mean discrepancy, 
as a sum of m on two terms, which are h, okay? So h is this kx, x, k, y, y, et cetera. This subscript tells me which kernel I'm using, and my v's here are the pairs, you know, x two i minus one, x two i, y two i minus one, y two i. So that's, you know, my pair x one, x two, y one, y two, then x three, x four, y three, y four, and so on and so on. Okay, and there are m on two such terms. Okay, so this is the notation. So now, why would I use an average of m on two terms to compute my MMD when I could use an average of m squared terms? So initially, it seems pretty nonsensical because the variance of an average of you know, order m, on squared, uh, m squared terms will be much lower, right? I'm averaging over many more terms. My variance is much smaller. So if my goal is to detect how large MMD is, then it seems to make sense to use an expression with a much smaller variance. So in, in some sense, like if I've got M samples, then the best I'm going to do is to take an average of M squared terms. And that's true. But one point is that if I have a lot of data, then in the time that I could average over M squared terms here, I could look at you know, the square of the number of data points in my order m statistic. So rather than, you know, averaging over all permutations of m points, I just look at a lot more points. So, you know, I, I could match then the cost. I could just say, like, I've got unlimited data, I just spend the same amount of computation. So, an advantage of using this linear statistic, if I've got enough data to do it, is that the asymptotic distribution of this linear time statistic, as we'll see, is very simple, and I don't need to use something like an expensive permutation test to get the null threshold. Okay? So, overall, I spend less computation to get a given power in this setting than I do in that setting. So, another way of saying this is that, like, you know, Traditionally, statistical testing has been a question of torturing the data until it confesses. So you have m points, you squeeze it as much as you can, you compute the minimum variance and bias statistic, and then you do whatever it takes. You do a permutation to get the null, etc. But now, if I have unlimited data, then my uh, limit, my, my uh, limiting factor is not, you know, how how small I can make the variance, but it's the amount of time I can spend. So, you know, I've got all the data in the world, but I need my, my uh, limiting factor is the computation time. So if my limiting factor is the computation time, then this style of test might be a better option because I'll get better power for a given amount of computation than I would from this kind of test. Okay, so let's see, you know, why it is that this has such a simple distribution. Remember that this linear time statistic here is just the average of m on two independent terms, right? And by central limit theorem, this has an asymptotically normal distribution. So here, I don't have this infinite weighted sum of chi squareds anymore. I just have a simple normal distribution. And I can compute its variance in closed form. So this is really nice. I just compute the variance. It takes the variance I can compute with the same cost as the statistic itself. Then I just, you know, plug it into my Gaussian cumulative distribution function, I get my test threshold, and I'm done. Okay? So, here is my hypothesis test. I've got my linear time statistic, which I know is asymptotically normal, so this is my statistic. It's unbiased, so zero mean. Okay? And then I find some quantile of that, which is basically like some, you know, high quantile of the distribution such that it's unlikely that I'll exceed this threshold uh, when P and Q are the same. And then all of this area here, this corresponds to the probability of exceeding the threshold under the P equals Q assumption. So that's my type 1 error. Okay, so that's a false positive. So now, let's say that P and Q are different, and its mean is here. Well, again, the asymptotic distribution of this statistic is Gaussian. And so, given that I've chosen this as my test threshold, this is the probability that I'll accidentally say that P and Q are the same when really they're different, okay? So this area here is my type 2 error, so a false negative. 
right? And so now, how do I choose my kernel? Well, I would choose it to make this area as small as possible, right? So, you know, I've set this threshold. I've said I want to control the number of type 1 errors, the number of false positives. I'll say it's like I want 5% false positive rate. That's something I fix as a user. And then I say, like, given that I want a 5% false positive rate, I want to minimize this area here, minimize the chance that I miss that P and Q are different, right? So how would I choose, like, just abstractly a kernel to do this? Well, one thing would be to choose my k to push this thing as far out as possible, right? As far away from zero as possible. And that would make this area small. But there's a little subtlety, which is that the variance of this Gaussian also depends on my choice of k, right? So maybe if I choose a really skinny kernel, I'll push this way out here, but I'll also make my variance really wide. So it won't be any use to me, because, like, you know, I'll make even more of these errors. So this is something to think about. So how do we somehow like trade off pushing this thing out and yet not making it too wide? Like I want to push the mean out, but I also want to keep the uh, variance small. OK, so let's do this in math, right? So this, is, this probability here is exactly this blue area here. OK, this is the probability that my test statistic is less than the threshold, okay? Which I'm going to say, you know, given that my MMD, my distance between P and Q, is not zero, okay? And because everything is Gaussian, I just have a, an expression in terms of the cumulative distribution functions of the Gaussian, right? So that's, that's what I've written here, and alpha is the type 1 error. So this is a probability that I think that P and Q are different when really they're the same. So how do I minimize this quantity here? Well, the CDF of any distribution is monotonically increasing, right? So if I want to minimize this, I would want to maximize this ratio here, right? Because I'm subtracting it. Okay, so minimizing type 2 error amounts to maximizing the ratio of the statistic to its variance, which is exactly what you'd expect, right? Because if I maximize the ratio of this statistic, to the variance of these two Gaussians, then you know, I'm pushing this out very far and I'm squeezing the Gaussians in to make them thin. So the mathematics and our intuition correspond. Okay? So how do you choose the best kernel? Well, it's easy. I just maximize the ratio of the statistic to the variance. That is how to choose the best kernel. Are there questions or is that clear? Yep. Why does the maximum exist? Ah. I think that's a good question. Um, we know there should be a maximum because this ratio is always going to be non negative, and it's zero when the kernel is infinitely broad and it's zero when the kernel is infinitely skinny. So somewhere between those two, there should be a maximum somewhere. Does that make sense? You, you don't, you're not sure. Does that make, is there a reason that doesn't make sense? It could be a supremum. Okay, so maybe like the, okay. You have a sequence. Which you have a sequence. Which okay, which is outside of the space. Okay, could this happen? Um, I need to think about that, yeah. So I know that if I choose the maximum of this thing itself over the range of kernel sizes, that that does converge to something which isn't infinite. Um, for the ratio, we've always used like finite families of kernels. I think if we use infinite families of kernels, we might have to be careful. So that is a good point, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that one we, we would need to think about carefully, yeah. Okay, so, um, okay, assuming that the maximum exists, which has to be checked, uh, this is the way to choose a good kernel. So, yep? So this, this family of kernels uh, is infinite, right? Like you can count That's right. 
Mm -hmm. And you're just changing the Adjusting the bandwidth, yeah. Right. yeah. So I mean, that's, that's the example that I was talking about here. If I had a Gaussian kernel and I made the bandwidth zero, this would be zero. Like this ratio would approach zero. And if I make the kernel bandwidth, uh, you know, so if I make the kernel infinitely thin, it, the ratio approaches zero. If I make it infinitely broad, the ratio approaches zero. Um, so th that I can say. But then, like, maybe somewhere in between, there should be, yeah. So at least uh, in the paper, what we did is we looked at a particular family of kernels, which is finite. And so there we maybe get away from this uh, difficulty of worrying about whether the limit of the sequences of kernels is, in, uh, is uh, d like, uh, I guess, contained in the class or not. So, OK, so here is our family of kernels. Um, so here is, is where my uh, keeping track of the kernel that I'm using becomes so crucial, right? So I've got a family of kernels, which I'm saying is a weighted combination of base kernels. OK? Um, so there's D of these base kernels. And I'm saying my weights have to be non-negative. And I'm saying that uh, they have to sum to some constant capital D, which is not particularly important, because it's just a question of scaling. Uh, yeah. So as long as at least one of my coefficients is not 0, then all of my, this sum here is a valid kernel. Like if all of them were 0, I just have a 0, which is not a very interesting kernel. Okay? And as long as all of my kernels are characteristic, then this sum should be characteristic. So I should be able to distinguish P and Q as long as all of my ingredients are able to distinguish P and Q. OK, so here is what my MMD looks like with this K, which is chosen from this family of the sum of kernels. All right, so the MMD, or the, actually in this case the squared MMD, is a sum of the MMDs for each of the kernels U in the family, where the weight of that sum is beta U. OK, so beta U is the weight of my youth kernel. Right? So. This is what I'm going to optimize over. I've got a vector of betas, OK? So d betas, because I've got d kernels. I've got a vector of uh, d of these statistics, which is my kxx plus kyy, et cetera, for the youth kernel, like kernel number u. And then this eta vector here is the expectation of these vectors here, OK? So I've got d mmds, right? And so, you know, if I've got this notation here, then the MMD for this kernel, which is the sum of the U kernels, is beta transpose eta. Eta is the MMDs for each of the kernels. Beta are the weights. And my uh, variance is beta transpose times covariance of this H vector here times beta. Right, so that's my notation. Yep. OK. So what I want to do is then to maximize the ratio of this quantity here to that quantity here. Now, when I maximize this ratio, I'm going to do that on a held out set of data, which is different to the data that I'm going to be using for testing. So does anyone want to say why that might be? So a hint would be like if I was doing classification and I learned my kernel on my test set, that might be a bad idea, right? So this overfitting idea applies as much to testing as it does to supervised learning, right? So imagine, you know, if I learned my kernel on the data that I'm using for testing, I'm getting something a little bit complicated because, you know, before I assumed my kernel was independent of the data I was testing. Now, if my kernel itself is some complicated function of the data I'm testing, then the asymptotic distribution of that quantity is going to change, right? So, you know, before, let's say, I, I had an average um, of terms which depend on the sample only, say, through k of x and y, right? But now, what if I have a kernel with a bandwidth which also depends on x and y and is a function of x and y? 
right? The asymptotic distribution of an average of these statistics with a fixed bandwidth will be different to the asymptotic distribution of a, uh, a sum of kernels where not only does the kernel depend on x and y, but it also depends on x and y indirectly because the bandwidth is chosen according to the sample. So, you know, the analysis that I do for this with a fixed sigma will not apply to an analysis that I might do for a kernel with a sigma that's changing according to my sample. And in particular, if I start adjusting my kernel according to my sample, I need to push my test threshold further away from the origin because now, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like, uh, in a sense, like overfitting and then I need to make my test threshold more conservative to compensate for the fact that I'm overfitting. So I get around all of that problem by just saying, like, I've got a huge amount of data, I leave some of it out to choose my kernel, and then I test on the rest. So is that clear, or are there questions about this idea? Okay, so I'm going to choose my kernel on a held out set of the data, and then test on the remaining data. Okay? So here is my optimization. I want to maximize the ratio of my test statistic to the variance. Okay? And my test statistic is the weighted sum according to beta of the MMDs computed for each of my individual kernels. And then this thing here is the covariance. So this is the covariance between the MMDs for each pair of kernels. So this is a D by D matrix here. And then I've added an extra regularization term here because, you know, I want to sort of push this away from zero, and this regularization has to drop as I see more samples. Okay? So I want to maximize this ratio. So this itself is a little bit tricky, but I can replace it with a simpler problem. So let's assume that at least one of my candidate MMDs is positive, right? So of all of the kernels that I've chosen, at least one of these distances is greater than zero. Then all that I need to do is to consider those entries of eta which are positive. So why, why would I throw away all of the kernels which give a negative MMD? So remember my asymptotic distribution? I'll write it down here. So here is my asymptotic distribution of MMD under H0, right? It's Gaussian. And I've said I've chosen this kernel, and this kernel has an MMD which is here, right? It's very unlikely that that kernel is any good because this kernel is basically saying my distance is effectively indistinguishable from zero, and it's sort of so bad that it's negative. So I'm going to throw away all those crappy kernels before I even start. I'm only going to consider the kernels that at least on the uh, training sample, on the sample I'm using to learn my kernel, they should at least have some MMDs out here. They should at least be in the right ballpark. Otherwise, why bother? OK, so I'm going to throw away all my negative ones and keep only the ones with positive MMD. Is that clear? OK, so I've thrown away all these. And then optimizing this quantity previously amounts to optimizing the square of it. And that's easy. That's just a quadratic program. So I'm, I'm minimizing this quadratic uh, convex function subject to a non-negativity constraint and a linearity constraint. So you can just like type quadprog in MATLAB, and that will solve that. OK, so that's what I'm optimizing. And this we've already covered. So if eta hat has no positive entries, then none of my kernels are any good. So then I just stop. And I choose another kernel or another problem. <laughs> OK, so here is my procedure, right? I split my data into testing and training. So this is something that, like, when I say this to a statistician, they get very upset because, like, hypothesis testing shouldn't require a training phase. But I think if you're using, like, a powerful non-parametric test, it always has a parameter, so you always, like, it always helps you to be able to set that parameter. So you might sort of argue, well, whatever parameter I choose, my test is consistent. That's true, but it might just be crap on your data, so it still helps to choose 
given the data you have, a parameter that makes sense. Okay? So I've got my training data. I compute this vector of MMDs for all of my kernels. I check that at least one of them is positive, all right? So I, I, I just keep all my positive ones. I solve my quadratic program, so I get my optimum weights, so the weights that minimize the type 2 error. And then I plug these weights. I choose my kernel to be the linear combination of base kernels using these weights. And then I do my MMD test on the remaining data using that kernel. OK, so that's my test procedure. And uh, when you choose the random kernel, how it influences uh, the beta and alpha in the first, uh, the errors on the first and second time? So if I'm choosing my kernel in this way, right, I am choosing the kernel to minimize this area <coughs> on my training data. So of course, you know. I mean random. Yeah. Um, so is your, what, uh, is your question like, what is, does well, the beta it, converge? This randomness, it, it, in fact, it influences uh, the power, power of your test. So <laughs> this is why I learn this kernel on a held out set, because like, I fix that kernel. So the, when I do my test, my test only sees the kernel I've given it. It doesn't know how I got that kernel. Okay. So I'm good. This is, this is the important uh, trick. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm basically like, I'm constructing this image and then I'm minimizing that area. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, no, I, I think like the moment you have a hypothesis test which is powerful and the statistic depends on some parameter, holding out some data and minimizing the type 2 error to me seems a pretty sensible approach. Yeah. So certainly not just for MMD, but generally. Mm -hmm. Not independent, it's MMD, so it's two samples, uh, right? So I think what your, your question is very sensible. So another way of putting it is like, what if this was actually zero? Like in the most extreme case, right? What if P and Q were actually the same? Well, then one of two things will happen. Either none of my statistics will be negative, so that's, uh, sorry, will be positive, but that's actually, un so, okay, let's just say this is the same. So basically for all of my kernels, I would get something like this red distribution with very differing variances, right? And so, you know, some of my statistics would randomly be a bit positive, some would be a little bit negative, right? I throw away all my negative ones because I know they are bad a priori, and then I choose, like, the kernel that gives this best thing here, which is pretty much a random kernel, because like all of them are going to be randomly distributed, plus and minus, OK? Then I take this randomly chosen kernel, and I do my test. Well, it, it really doesn't matter which kernel I would have chosen. I will still, you know, with 95% probability, find that P and Q are the same. Because I've fixed my kernel on my training set. My test set doesn't know that I've modified my kernel. It's just given this number. I compute on my test set the correct asymptotic distribution for that kernel. And then I have my correct type 1 and type 2 error. Yeah. So that's, again, like why it's so essential to uh, choose your kernel on your training set and not on your test set. Because otherwise, you could indeed like say, you know, I've found a really great kernel for this problem on my test set, which happens to be the kernel you know, which, which is just giving you an MMD here just by pure chance. Yeah. OK, so um, there is something that I will just sort of glance through and not uh, talk much about. So basically, um, for this finite family of kernels, I can guarantee that this ratio converges to something finite. So for an infinite family of kernels, I need to check, as I uh, discussed. But here, at least, I know that my empirical regularized ratio converges to my population ratio at some reasonable speed as I see more samples. So like the proxy that I'm using to choose my kernel, so to minimize my type 2 error, 
will, when I see enough samples, give me a good estimate of the true type 2 error. Okay? So how I prove this is not material. You can check the paper. Um, okay, so let's see now if it works. So one of the things, like when I propose this way to learn a kernel for hypothesis testing, I actually struggled quite a bit to find problems where it matters to choose the right kernel. So a lot of the time, if you just choose the kernel as the sort of median distance between pairs of your uh, P and Q points, that actually works uh, depressingly well most of the time. Um, so when you're trying to persuade a reviewer of a paper that your paper is worthwhile, uh, you might struggle. Um, but after a lot of work, we found uh, examples where it does matter to choose your kernel. And I'm going to talk about these and, and why uh, they're difficult. Okay? So we've got all of these different ways of choosing the kernel, right? So one is to choose this kernel according to the median distance between pairs of points in P and Q, and that's like the classic median heuristic that you've been using for the last 15 years. Okay? Um, another thing is, like, let's just avoid the variance. Let's ignore the variance and let's just maximize the, choose the kernel that maximizes the distance between P and Q while just completely ignoring the variance. And you can maximize that subject to two constraints on the kernel weight. One is that, you know, they should sum to one. The second is that uh, the L2 norm should be less than or equal to one. So either of these are fine, okay? If I... Uh, there's also a, a rather interesting approach. So um, one approach that was proposed was like, well, let's think of the MMD as a classification problem with a linear loss. All right, I'm, I'm trying to classify P from Q using a linear loss function. So if I think of it as a classification problem, then I can cross-validate to choose my best kernel. I just cross-validate on my held-out sample to find the kernel that has the lowest cross-validation error. And this is, in a sense, a, a slightly more sophisticated version of just maximizing my statistic. And so maybe it gives a, a slightly better kernel. But from the figures that I showed you earlier, you should be suspicious of this approach because it's mixing metaphors. It's saying, like, let's choose a kernel that gives me a good classifier. But I haven't asked you to classify. I've asked you to do a hypothesis test. And I know when I'm doing a hypothesis test that the variance matters. I've shown you that diagram. OK? So now let's see how they do. So first of all, like when might I expect this median heuristic to fail? When it might fail is that I would like the length scale of the difference in distributions to, be, to not be the length scale of the sample in some sense. So here is an example to illustrate this kind of uh, poorly worded point. Here is P. P is a grid of Gaussians, OK? And these Gaussians are isotropic. Here is Q. So Q is a grid of Gaussians with exactly the same means. But now, they're a little bit uh, skewed. So they have, they're, they're no longer isotropic, OK? Now, if I compute the median distance between points on these grids, that will be quite a coarse number, right? Because it will be on the sort of scale of this entire grid. But actually, the kernel that I need to distinguish P from Q should be a narrow kernel, because it should be on the scale of the difference of the distributions. OK? So it should be looking at this little skewness here and not at this sort of scale of the entire sample. So this is an instance where the median heuristic will fail dismally. OK? So let's watch it fail. So this ratio here is how skewed my distributions are. So the more skewed it is, the easier it is to see the difference, OK? I'm stretching these guys out more and more, OK? And on this axis is type 2 error, so smaller is better. So this is the you know, fraction of times that I've missed that P and Q are different. So if I miss 95% you know, of the time, I'm doing pretty poorly, OK? So this, is, this plot has a lot of uh, figures on it, so let's look at them one by one. So these best performing lines are what I get when I optimize the ratio on my training data of my MMD to its standard deviation. So I do exactly what I said. I make the type 2 error as small as possible. And that's doing pretty well. I've got two plots here, because in one of them, I just go through the list of all my ratios, and I choose the kernel with the largest ratio. In the second line, I solve the quadratic programming problem and find the weight. And of course, you know, the biggest weight is on the best kernel. There's only one large weight, and I'm done. 
okay? And they're getting pretty similar results. Okay, what are these three figures? So this lowest one here is where I say, well, what if I notice that the MMD is classification with linear loss and I do cross-validation? And that's not doing too badly, but it's not doing as well as I would be able to do if I also took the variance into account. So mixing metaphors is the wrong idea for this problem. It's not a disaster, but it's not going to give you the best test. These two traces here are just maximizing the statistic on the, test, on the training data, subject to some constraint, either L1 or L2 on the sum of the weights. So you know these, aren't, uh, these are doing a little bit less well than cross-validation, and they're doing a lot less well than taking into account the variance. Yeah? So you still do plots, and you retain the shape or the different shape. Yep. And you move them much, much further apart. No, no. So these, these um, oh, sorry, if, if you move them apart. Yes. yes ah. So, so like yeah. Much yep. Like Is that the, like the end position? <laughs> right. So if, if I had P and Q, but rather than the means coincided, I, I just pulled this blue one like way, way far from my red one. So then, the, uh, in, in this case, if I computed my median on my pooled sample, uh, the median distance would be much bigger, right? Because it would also be on the scale of the distance from P to Q, which is something very large now. Um, and indeed, uh, the median heuristic and the uh, result that I would get from optimizing my test power would then be pretty similar. So, like, you know, if I've a way to say that at a high level is that if I have P and Q and their means are very far apart, then the median heuristic gives me very, like, uh, not, not too dissimilar an answer to if I optimize my kernel to maximize my test power. Because that's kind of what we started with. Like, we were hoping we'd already get good results for that, and we didn't. So then we started doing this. Yeah. OK. And then, yeah, so this is how the median heuristic performs. And basically, it chooses such a bad kernel that you can never tell that P and Q are different, given the number of samples that you've seen for this problem. OK, so that's pretty terrible. OK, so here is another example where you need to learn a kernel. So imagine that I've got um, P and Q, which are different, uh, but they're different. Uh, you know, the differences can take one of two forms, right? So here is. Now, Q can either be a mean shifted Gaussian in the x1 axis with probability half, or a mean shifted Gaussian on the second axis with probability half. All right? Now, imagine that I have a family of kernels where each kernel is a Gaussian on a single one of these axes. Okay? So I can put this problem in much higher dimensions. So I've got, you know, here's dimension one, so it can be different in dimension one. Here is dimension two, it can be different in dimension two. And it's always the same in dimensions three through 28. Okay? So then what I would do is hopefully I would learn kernels, like, you know, I, I have my kernel which is a weighted sum of kernels. I would hope that the weight is big for x1 and big for x2, and then small for everything else. So let's see if this works. So here is my dimension. So remember, only dimensions 1 and 2 count, and all of the rest of the dimensions are noise. And here is my uh, probability that I miss that P and Q are different on this axis. OK, so smaller is better. So what's interesting about this problem, it's actually somewhat of an easy problem. But um, what you notice is that there is no single best kernel in my family of kernels. So in the previous example, Choosing the single best kernel was the same as choosing the kernel uh, from a weighted sum of kernels, because the weight would only be big on a single kernel. In this case, if I choose my single best kernel, which is to say the kernel that maximizes my ratio, well, half the time it's axis 1, half the time it's axis 2. But like whichever kernel I choose, I'm going to miss the other thing. Whereas if I take a weighted sum of the kernel on axis 1 and kernel on axis 2, then I do much better, because I always see the difference between P and Q. So does that make sense? So here, in the previous problem, the, the, there was only one best kernel in the family. In this problem here, the best kernel is a weighted sum of two kernels, one kernel which sees the difference along this axis, and the second that sees the difference along that axis. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> 
Um, so now this is another of the examples that I started my talk with, which is this amplitude modulated audio. So I'll actually skip over all of the figures. You can sort of check that later. But here is a, a picture. So each sample from P is a vector of length 1,000, OK, which is a sinusoid modulated by some envelope which encodes an audio signal. So this envelope here is 0 0.01 seconds of a, an audio clip from a CD. Okay? All of these are audio clips drawn from one song, and all of these are audio clips drawn from a second song. And my question is, are these from a different distribution to those? Okay? So that's a pretty hard problem. So the means is zero, it's in high dimension. The variance is a one. So I need some sort of notion of high order uh, you know, representation of my distributions to be able to tell <coughs> this set of samples apart from that set of samples. Okay? So here is my performance. So basically, like, I'm making this problem a little bit harder by adding extra noise to my amplitude modulated signals. Here is what I get with the median heuristic. Not very good. Okay? Here is what I get with my, uh, you know, if I ignore the variance of my statistic and just maximize the difference in means of features under P and Q, better. And now here is what I get if I actually maximize the ratio of my statistic to its variance. And here you can see that using the single best kernel actually gives you a bit of an edge over using a weighted sum of kernels. So somehow, like it's a, a sort of sparsity constraint which helps you if you just say, I want one good kernel. OK, so I've, I think, uh, covered all of what I want to cover about how to choose the kernel. So are there questions about that before I go on? Yeah? So is there an interpretation of what kind of sequence these kernels are this audio uh, No, I don't, and that would be interesting, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm just using, like, a Gaussian kernel and a huge number of samples here. So, um, you know, it might be interesting to uh, figure out, actually, uh, what it means to use these, you know, Hermite polynomial style features, say, for this example, but I haven't looked into that. Yeah. Okay. All right, so what I will do is now to go to part three, which is here. Let me check my time. Good. Um, so, this I have like oh yeah. You had a question from the other yep. What is the question? Um, the question is uh, I don't understand uh, how do you specify the family of kernels? Okay, so, so I mean you just shifted the problem from finding the kernel to finding the family of kernel and. Sure. So I mean, in a sense, uh, the family of kernels that you use is something that you need to define. Um, so it is true that, uh, let's say, it, it may be that uh, there's a testing problem which is solvable, so you can distinguish P and Q, uh, but which is not solvable with any of the kernels in your family. And that's, in a sense, just bad luck, right? So what I've shown you is that if you have you know, a family of plausible kernels, but you don't know which one to choose, then I've shown you how to find a weighted combination of those kernels, which will solve your testing problem. If all of your kernels are no good, then you need to go back to the drawing board. So, you know, I've, I've basically enlarged the, the set of kernels you might consider in your testing problem, but I haven't told you, like, you know, how to design that family of kernels from the ground up. For that, you know, you, you need to sort of uh, think a bit. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I would say also, though, that um, I, I'm going to sort of uh, take uh, shelter in statistics here, that like, as long as my family of kernels are characteristic, then if I see enough data, I will eventually be able to tell the difference between the distributions. So I will be able to solve my problem eventually, even though it might take me longer. For finite data, if your two distributions differ not in the first 10 moments, yep. 
Right. So, I mean, the question is like whether uh, if distributions differ in very high moments, the Gaussian kernel is enough. So, in the example of Gauss versus Laplace, where we had that you know Gaussian and Laplace with the same mean and same variance, uh, the Gaussian kernel works fine on that. Um, so, I think it's not necessarily the fact of them differing in high moments that makes the problem hard. Uh, it's whether this difference is like. Uh, subtle or blatant. Uh, I think a clearer way to understand what's a hard problem for testing is to think of it in terms of the frequencies at which the characteristic functions differ. So remember, uh, way back, we defined our MMD. Um, so this is a good question, which is why I'm giving a detailed answer, right? Um, I think, is there an eraser somewhere? Uh, ah, yeah, here it is. Okay. Okay, I think that should be enough to start with. Okay, so I defined my MMD uh, in the Fourier series setting as follows, right? I had the sum over I of the absolute value of my characteristic function of P, uh, index K, right? Uh, sorry, uh, I, index I, minus characteristic function of Q, index i modulus squared times the Fourier series representation of my k i, right? This was my MMD between p and q in this Fourier series setting, MMD, p, q, right? Now, remember that this kernel here, let's say that I'm using a kernel whose spectrum decays as a Gaussian, right? If P and Q have characteristic functions that differ at high frequencies, this distance will be very small, and it will be hard to distinguish it from the case of P and Q being the same. So this is, this is uh, I think, a quick way to sort of tell if a testing problem is hard or easy, not necessarily through moments, the, the moments that they differ being high, but whether the characteristic functions differ at low or high frequencies. So in this Gauss versus Laplace example, the characteristic functions differed at low frequencies. So it was an easy problem, even though they were different in the fourth moment. Oh, I mean, you would have to uh, play with that yourself. Yeah. OK. Um, so. Here are some things that uh, we might talk about in more or less detail. Um, so I think this one I, I will start with because this is a very nice uh, result. So this is like I've looked at dependence testing, but you know maybe I've got more than two variables. Maybe I've got three variables. And so I might be interested in how more than two variables interact and testing properties of that. Um, a second thing that I might talk about, depending on how we go for time, is uh, a little bit more about dependence detection. So I've introduced HSIC, and I've sort of given this example of, of how you might uh, think about HSIC. But I don't believe that, you know, this example is a sort of incomplete uh, view of how dependence uh, is, a, is sort of measured. So I, I think I'll talk a little bit about this. This one I don't think I'm going to talk about today, but this is quite interesting, so I'll just tell you quickly now what it is. We've introduced ways of representing distributions in a feature space. But you might think, well, what if I want to do inference, right? What if I want to apply Bayes' law, say? For this, I need conditional distributions in feature space. So this section here, which is all in the slides, um, tells you how to define conditional distributions in feature space. And once you've defined them, you can then perform inference. So where, where might this be uh, exciting? So imagine like I have a robot navigating a room, and the robot has a position, which I don't know, and it sees an image, right? And the image tells me something about where it is. So it might be very hard for me to write down a parametric model mapping what the robot sees to where the robot is. What this tells me is that I don't need to do that. So what I do is I observe like you know, the robot moving around. I, I see in, during training its position and its images. And then I learn these uh, conditional feature space representations just from that data. 
Okay, so I, I learned basically like how the robot's dynamics uh, operates, so what kind of uh, movement trajectories it has. And I learn, given its position, what kind of image it's likely to see. But all of this is done entirely learning these uh, conditional probability representations in feature space. And then I can run filtering. So let's say that now I'm no longer allowed to see where my robot is, but I'm only allowed to see the photographs that it is, is able to observe. Then I can predict where it is in the room. And I can do that without ever having to write down a model. So this is, this is what this is about. OK. Um, and then I have some more recent work, which is also very interesting. In particular, uh, this, this one is quite fun. So I can do um, adaptive Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, and in particular, uh, adaptive HMC. So if you want to know about that, you should ask me. OK. So let's first talk about three variable interactions. OK. So this is the example that I, I began you know, two lectures ago with. I've got two parents that influence a child, OK? And the case that I'm interested in is that when each of these parents individually have a weak influence, but in combination have a strong influence. So the example that I had was, like, I put sugar in my coffee, but I didn't stir it. It makes it a little sweeter. But I put, if I put sugar in my coffee and I also stir it, then suddenly my coffee becomes very sweet, OK? So individual weak links, but combined strong links, OK? Here's a more uh, numerical example of that same uh, thing. I've got my two parents, which are IID Gaussians, right? And these influence the child in such a way that if I look at the marginal distributions of X and Z and Y and Z individually, I see no dependence. But if I look at the combination of effects of X and Y on Z, I have a strong dependence. OK? So. This is, uh, you know, this is a, an extreme example because it violates faithfulness because I'm not allowed to draw these arrows unless individually they have an effect, but I'm, I'm just sort of taking some sort of limit uh, to, to illustrate the point. Okay? So how do I detect these structures? So I've told you already how to do independence testing, so let's say that I've done an independence test and I've established that X and Y are independent. Okay? So now... One approach to finding this v-structure is that I know that if I condition on z, then x and y should become dependent, right? That's, that's the property of the v-structure. And this is one thing I could do. I could say, like, is it the case that x and y become dependent when I condition on z? And there is a test for that. But testing this is pretty hard, OK? Alternatively, what could I do? I could just say, like, let's do a whole bunch of independence tests, OK? I could say, Am I able to break this arrow here so that y is broken off from this xz pair? Or can I break x off from the yz pair? Or if I consider y and uh, x and y together, can I break them off jointly from the z pair? If I can do none of those things, then I conclude that this graph cannot be factorized in any way, right? And so that means that there must be these edges here. And because I've also established that x and y are independent, I'm left with this v structure. So this is an approach. Where it might be a little uh, tricky is that these independence tests are relatively high-dimensional independence tests because I'm concatenating Y and Z together and testing whether they're independent of X. And I know that testing gets harder the more dimensions you're in. So that's just something to uh, be cautious of here. OK? So here's my problem, and I'm going to make it high-dimensional by adding noise dimensions. So I've got, you know, x, y, and z, as I've shown here, and then I've just appended a bunch of dimensions that have no information to them, OK? So what you see here is the number of noisy dimensions I've added, and this is the type 2 error, and this rapidly basically goes to 1, so I never notice that I've got a v-structure after very few noise dimensions. OK, so how do I do better? Let's see, OK? So let's go back to the independence case. What was I doing? I was looking whether the joint distribution factorizes into the product of the marginals, OK? So I've got PXY. Does that factorize into the product PX times PY? What kind of statistic is analogous to that but for three variables? So my question is now, I've got three variables. Does this distribution factorize? <laughs> 
And I'm going to uh, claim that this is a statistic that I might use to answer that question. And, you know, it, it looks a little bit uh, cumbersome, so let's uh, see it in figures, okay? So what is this statistic here? I take my joint distribution, I subtract from it this measure here. This measure here tells me that x is independent of y and z. I subtract from it this measure here, where y is independent of x and z. I subtract this case, and then I add two of these. Okay, so that's what I'm doing. So let's see how this statistic behaves in the event that the truth is that px is independent of yz. Okay, so if px is independent of pyz, then this distribution here is equal to that distribution there, right? So these both cancel, the red guys cancel. Now I have all of these terms here, right? But all of these terms here are just px times py times pz, right? That's px times py times pz, that's px times py times pz. So this minus this plus two of these cancel as well. So basically, like, if this factorization occurs, then every term in this cancels and it's zero. And I can make exactly the same argument when other factorizations occur. So I might say, what if y is the variable I can break off? Well, I do the same reasoning again, okay? So this statistic, basically, you know, as long as one of these things occur, either I can break off z, I can break off y, I can break off x, then the statistic will be zero. Can I make the implication in the other direction? Well, no, I can't, un unfortunately, right? So I can find a distribution of three variables that doesn't factorize at all, and yet it makes this statistic zero, okay? So there is a, you know, and, and here is just for fun, you can, you can like compute it and find out for yourself. That's, this is an instance of that distribution where all my three variables are binary. So this distribution doesn't factorize, and yet this is zero. So, you know, what use is it? Well, okay, it still has a use. So, I compute this statistic, and I find it's not zero. That means that, you know, by this implication here, there can exist no factorization, okay? So that means, going back to my V-structure detection problem, if I've established my parents are independent, and I compute this statistic, and it's not zero, then I can be sure that there's a V structure. If I compute my statistic and it is zero, then there's nothing I can do. It may be a V structure, it may not. Then I have to start you know, doing something harder, like a real conditional dependence test. So if I'm in a pathological situation, I'm in trouble. Otherwise, I'm okay. Right? So. This is my statistic, so remember what I did for HSIC. I have this PXY minus PXPY. I computed the mean embedding of this minus the mean embedding of that. I took the norm, and that was my statistic. So I do exactly the same here, okay? I choose as my kernel the products of kernels on X and Y and Z, just as I did for the uh, HSIC, where I chose as my kernel the product of kernels on X and Y. All right? And then I embed, you know, pxyz minus px, p, pxypz minus blah, 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 okay? And, you know, I then expand out this thing, and I get a whole bunch of terms, and I get a huge matrix full of, like, a million things, and it looks pretty painful. But it turns out that for three variables, all of this stuff boils down to a very simple expression, okay? Which is basically, like, it's a sort of three-way covariance, between the matrix K, the matrix L, and the matrix M. So this is like a joint central moment. So matrix K is my kernel matrix on X, matrix L is my kernel matrix on Y, M is my kernel matrix on uh, Z. I center these matrices, I take the entry-wise product, I take the sum, that's my statistic. Okay, so very simple statistic. So now we use that for that difficult testing problem, and suddenly we're doing way better. Okay, so this is my type 2 error now using this Lancaster statistic. So it's actually giving me like results 
when you know, each of my variables is five-dimensional. So this is a, a very difficult problem, but I'm still making no errors. I mean, it's difficult for two reasons. One is that it's high-dimensional, and second is that individually the parents have no influence on the child. Only jointly do they have an influence. Okay? So here I've set up a problem where I have a faithful graph. So with probability a third, x has a strong influence on z. With probability a third, y has a strong influence on z. But with probability on a third, they have this combined influence only. So individually you can't see them, but combined they have a strong influence, okay? And in this case, I mean, we still have an advantage. It's not as strong because now these other tests can start to pick up on these strong links on their own but we still come out ahead. Okay. So I think my message here is that like, if you're in high dimensions, you know that conditional dependence testing won't work. Okay, it's just hard. So I would advise using this Lancaster test. If the Lancaster test finds an effect, then you're good. If it doesn't find an effect, then there's nothing you can say. There might be conditional dependence, they might not. But, you know, given you're in high dimensions, there's probably no way to find it. Okay. So there's another um, question you might ask, which is like, I've talked about interactions between three variables. Let's, let's you know, go crazy. Let's go to four variables. Okay. So I can define a statistic for, you know, n or k variables which is this thing here. So what is it? Like I look, I've got my distribution over, in this case, four variables. I look at all of the ways I can factorize it. So p, x1, x3, x2, x4. So that's what this j means. So j is over a partition of p. And then I weight it according to like the size of the partition, minus one raised to this power, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So where might things uh, become tricky here? Well, when you get you know, four, five, six variables, the number of ways that you can partition your variables into products of individual ones blows up extremely fast. Um, so this is our, our picture from Wikipedia. So this is the number of partitions as a function of D. And uh, this is apparently uh, called a Bell number, and it's growing uh, rather brutally. Okay? So that's one bad news. And the other bad news is, well, you might think, well, in the previous example with three variables, you had like a lot of terms, but that didn't matter because everything cancelled. So that is a fortunate property that is true for two and three variables, but not true for more. And the reason is that the you know, joint cumulants, which is what I care about here, and the joint central moments, which is what I computed for the Lancaster interaction, happen to be the same for two and three, vari two and three variables. But when you get to four or more variables, it's not the same. So all my terms don't cancel, and I have like a, a sum of very, very, very many terms, which I have to compute laboriously. So my advice, if you have more than three variables, is that you need to think about the question you're asking. So my question that I'm asking here is, does there exist any way to factorize the distribution over d variables? And that's a very general question. What I should ask instead is like, you know, is this group of variables independent of that group? Or do these three variables have a V structure? Rather than asking, like, you know, is there anything that allows me to factorize it in any possible way? Yeah? Okay. So are there questions about actually I have well, are there questions about this part so far? Okay. So another um, test you can do for D variables which is well posed and which you can compute sensibly is uh, the mutual uh, independence test. So I'm, what I'm saying is I've got like a large number of variables, but I want to know whether the joint distribution factorizes into the product of the marginals. So this is a simpler question. I'm not saying like, is there any possible factorization? I'm asking, is there this particular factorization? Okay. So in this case, you know, I use as my kernel the product of the kernels on the individual things. I'm looking at the uh, embedding of the joint minus the product of the marginals, and in this case, I get something reasonably simple with just three terms which I can compute. So this question is well posed enough that I can, I can actually 
uh, solve it, okay? So let's do a test of total independence for you know, one, three, five, et cetera, dimensions. Um, so I'm doing this now for just three variables, okay? So I'm just saying, like, I've, I've got two questions I'm asking. The Lancaster test asks, is there any possible way to factorize this distribution over three variables? The total independence test asks, does my distribution over three variables factorize into the product of the marginals? Okay? So what's interesting is that in low dimensions, my total independence test has an advantage over my Lancaster test. But in high dimensions, uh, interestingly, the Lancaster test takes the edge. And I'm still not uh, entirely sure whether that's a generally true statement or whether that's a, uh, I guess, a, a, um, a phenomenon due to the, the data set that I've chosen. So that would be an interesting thing to think about. But um, you know, obviously, if I've got more than three variables, like I've, if I've got four variables, then as we've seen, it's not practical to ask whether there's any possible way to factorize a distribution over four variables. So then I can still ask about total independence, but not Lancaster interaction. OK. So what I will do, I think I've got uh, around 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes or so left. Um, I'll talk in slightly more detail about kernel dependence measures. Okay, so this is how I introduced kernel dependence measures earlier. I have this matrix of similarities of my you know, images. I've got matrix of similarities of captions. I take the dot product between these two matrices. If it's big, then my images and captions are dependent. Okay? But this is not how you traditionally, uh, I guess, think about dependence. The way I tr traditionally think about dependence is in terms of something like covariance, right? Like I, I draw a line through my data. If the line has a slope, I've got some covariance. OK? But if my data have some nonlinear non dependence, then you know, covariance I need to generalize in some way. So this is a way that I propose to think about how to generalize covariance. I have, I have two smooth functions which transform my data and after that transformation, they have some covariance. So if that's true, then my data are dependent. And smoothness matters, just like it did in MMD. OK, so here's data x and y. And I like type in core on MATLAB, and it says 0. But I can tell just by looking that x and y are dependent, right? Because knowing where x is tells me something about where y is. So let's take this smooth mapping of x and this smooth mapping of y and apply that. So I apply this mapping to the x-axis and this mapping to the y-axis. So if you think of this as a sheet of paper, I folded it twice. Once about the y-axis, once about the x-axis. And if I do that, then suddenly my correlation is really big. Right? So I said that if I can find two smooth functions that transform my data to have a high linear dependence, then my data are dependent. OK? Smoothness matters. If I just said, can I find any two functions, well, I could get a perfectly straight line from completely independent data, and that would be boring. OK? So this notion is, is a nice intuition, but how do I define covariance in infinite feature spaces? OK? So let's see what I mean, first of all, when I define covariance in finite spaces. OK? So, Let's say I have two vectors, one in Rd and one in Rd dash. Are they dependent? Well, I can define a covariance matrix between them. I'm assuming zero mean, so this is a covariance matrix. Okay? So, you know, this, this is a matrix. It's D by D prime, but I want a simple number. I'm just asking, like, are these dependent or not? Having a matrix of D by D prime values is, is a complicated answer to a simple question. So what I could do to summarize this matrix is I could take its maximum singular value, right? Because that's a good way to summarize it. Like, if the maximum singular value is 0, then I know that there can be no covariance between any of the pairs of, uh, of, of coordinates in this thing, right? So I take this matrix and I take its maximum singular value, which amounts to finding the vectors of norm 1 that have largest covariance. So basically, like, I've got my x random vector, I project it onto a uh, f, which is a vector of unit norm, but in some 
helpful direction. I have my vector here. I project it onto another vector of unit norm. I find the covariance between these two projections, and I choose my f, f and g to make that covariance as large as possible. Maximum singular vector value, yeah. And if this is zero, then I don't have any dependence. So this notion is exactly what I want to do in feature space, right? Because rather than x's, I want features of x, and rather than y, I want features of y. And then this would be a covariance between my f of x and g of y, but in feature space, OK? So my first question is, like, can I define an analog to x, y transpose in feature space? And it turns out I can. So this is a well-defined thing. So um, the, the quickest way to, to sort of see this um, is basically think of what an outer product means in linear algebra. OK, it's a matrix with the property that if I multiply that matrix by a new vector, I just get the G transpose H multiplied by my F vector. So that's like an outer product. And I can do the same in feature space. So another way to think about it, which is not on these slides, is that like a feature space covariance, I could have something like this, right? Let's say my features of X were X and X squared, right? And my features of Y were Y and Y squared and Y cubed, right? then you know, what's this outer product? Well, it's x times y, x times y squared, x times y cubed. So this feature space covariance is just that, but maybe there are infinitely many features. So it could be as, as big as an infinity by infinity matrix. Right? But that's all it is. It's a matrix where each entry is the covariance between one feature, a feature of x, and another feature, which is a feature of y. So are you allowed to write an infinity by infinity matrix? The answer is yes, and I'm not going to tell you in any detail why. Um, but basically, the argument is exactly the same as the argument that we made to ensure that the, uh, the mean embedding exists. And it amounts to checking that the expectation of the square root of the product of the kernels of x and y is, found, is, is bounded. Okay? So I'm allowed to make an infinity by infinity matrix and that matrix has exactly the property that I want, which is that if I take this matrix and I make it act on this feature space G, and then I take the dot product with this feature space F, then I get the covariance of F and G. So that's exactly what I did two slides ago here. I said F transpose CXYG is the covariance between F and G. OK? So that's, that's my matrix. And that's actually what I'm doing when I get these functions here. I'm just like, uh, I'm defining my empirical covariance matrix, which is the sum of xy transposes, and I'm getting its maximum singular ve ve uh, vector values and vectors. Okay? So the math in this case isn't important. This is just how I'm computing these functions. Okay? These are the eigenvectors of this covariance in feature space. OK, so all of this doesn't matter. Why is it helpful to think about it in this way? Well, it tells me, actually, what is a hard independence testing problem. OK? So let's just look at this. Here is a density on x by y. It has a lot of amplitude here. It has low amplitude there, right? So I've got a lot of points here and a lot of points there. So if I just glance at this, I can see that x and y are dependent. Here is the same number of points drawn from that density. And this is difficult, right? If I look at this, I can't tell that x and y are dependent. It looks uniform to me, OK? My covariance understanding helps me to realize why it is that this is a hard problem and this is an easy problem, OK? So here is problems of increasing difficulty. Here is the covariance between smooth functions of x and y, right? And the covariance is dropping as I see more and more samples. So why might that be, OK? Here is my first one. Here are the smooth functions that give me high or relatively high linear correlation. OK? Here's a second case. So I can still s find two smooth functions of these variables here and get high linear correlation. OK? Because, you know, the, the dependence between x and y is still pretty smooth. Now it's getting harder. OK? So 
Here I, I still have smooth functions that work, but my correlation is starting to drop. Here it's even harder, right? So my correlation is now quite a lot lower. These functions are starting to look rather implausible. In this case, I've actually generated uniform samples, and it's just saying, well, here are some functions that give me correlation. But this correlation will be indistinguishable from chance, because this is just the chance level correlation you get for completely independent samples. And as I see more samples, this is going to drop to zero. OK, so is it clear why it is that this, uh, I guess, view of, of uh, dependence allows you to see what's a hard and an easy testing problem? Yeah? OK. So, you know, this is just to summarize that idea. Um, you know, as dependence is encoded at high frequencies, you need more and more non smooth functions to transform those variables to have a high linear correlation. And at some point, you know, the smoothness constraint will be strong enough that you basically, uh, and, and the dependence will be non smooth enough that you won't be able to see the dependence. OK? So what you might then think is, well, if I can find two smooth functions that can cause a, a strong correlation, what if I take the next singular functions? Okay? They have a weaker correlation, but it's still not zero. Okay? What if I take the next two? I can continue this, right? So why don't I just take the sum of the squared covariances that I get for all my pairs of functions? Okay? So I take you know, my first function, I compute the covariance between these smooth functions, and then I take the next two, I compute the covariance there, and I take the next two, and I take the next two, and I take the sum of the squared covariances for all of those pairs of functions. Then this turns out to be exactly h sig. So this is, to my mind, like a, a much more interpretable understanding of what h sig is doing. Right? So I said, you know, h sick is, well, the difference between the mean embedding of the joint and the mean embedding of the product of the marginals. And like, if I tell that to a biologist, they'll just you know, stare at me and, and then walk away. Whereas if I say, look, I found these two smooth functions that give a strong linear covariance, then that's interpretable. I found a smooth transformation of my data, which has a strong dependence. OK? And that's something that I can then write up. OK? So if I use h sick and I say, well, my I found a strong significant dependence, then it might be worth also like looking for these two maximum singular functions so that I can actually understand what that dependence is. So I can understand what smooth transformation of my variables gives me a high linear covariance. So are there questions about this idea? OK. So I think. I'm yeah, probably done, so I'm going to skip through. Uh, I want to show just one more thing. Uh, where is it? Here we go. Yep. So I just wanted to advertise uh, this delicious kernel beer, which you can buy when you're in London. <laughs> and uh, you know, obviously, the work I've presented is joint work with many uh, people who I've, I've worked with over the years, uh, some of whom are here, and some of whom are mentioned also in the uh, bibliography. So all of these slides are on my page. Uh, I think you can grab them. Um, the software for pretty much everything you've seen here is also on my page. So I hope that you grab that as well. Um, and yeah, so these are references that are here. So thank you.